is one of my dear friends, Jill Conrath. She's one of our favorite people. And uh, we've got to know her over the years as we've invited her into several of our virtual summits. And I have to tell you, she wins every single time with helping us get the most people to follow her to our events. Um, her following is very loyal, very interested in what she has to say. And so, I mean, literally, of all of them, we had 82 speakers, and she was number one of the people who wanted to come and hear her speak. So give her a hand just for that, would you? Yeah, she rocks. And um, remind you what we're doing. We are broadcasting a virtual summit all around the world, right here from the floor of Dreamforce. We're in the Moscone Center in the West Hall, if you want to come see us live. We've got a high-definition camera recording this for posterity's sake. We'll be saving it out as a, a YouTube video, a slide share. We'll break out the MP3s and offer it as a podcast. And um, we'll be doing blog articles about it. So all of, these, all of this content will be available after the fact. We also have a webcam broadcasting to our uh, virtual summit audience. We're showing her slides to them through On24, our partner there who helps us pull off these crazy things. And we're doing it from the floor of one of the largest trade shows in the world, Dreamforce, live. And I'll tell you, the first day was nuts. We had the internet go down. We had the Samsung monitor die on us. We had all kinds of, right in the middle of a presentation, try come bouncing back from that. And, um, but to remind everybody who's here local, we're giving away our little uh, drones that are remote controlled. There it is. It's controlled from your cell phone. Yes, very good. You download an app. There's a video out on YouTube called How to Fly the Dreamforce Drone. Now, we realized we needed that because within the first 10 seconds when we tried to do it ourselves, it went rogue on us and took off into the distance. Now, we had a bigger version, actually, with a camera on it. And it took us two days to find it. So here's what we've learned. Don't fly by power lines. Don't fly by a power substation. They tend to disrupt the, the video signal that you need. But the cool thing is when we found it, we captured the video of when it crashed. So we have one of the first uh, videos on a, dr a, dro uh, a drone going rogue and then crashing um, out there on the, the YouTube channel also. So enough said. Let me introduce Jill Conrath. Now, remind me of your title here today. I'll let uh, Jill Conrath. Yes, that's her name and her title. The name of your presentation. There we go. The human side of sales acceleration. I'm on like 44 of these, so apologize. I don't have all the titles in my head. But there's nobody better than Jill Conrath, so join me in welcoming, welcoming her to uh, our summit. That's kind of, it's kind of funny to, um, to come here with the sales acceleration company because honestly, I've been in the sales acceleration business my whole life, but without technology. So my expertise is talking about it from the human side. What does it take to get people to accelerate their sales with or without the use of technology? So that's what I'm going to be here today to talk about is the human side of technology. I don't know if any of you have read any of my books. Anybody read Snap Selling? From some of you, Agile Selling? couple of you, okay, and uh, Selling Big Companies was my first one. Some of you have read that too. But what I try to do is, is figure out what does it take to get more business in the door quickly. And after I wrote my second book, uh, Snap Selling, which is how to sell to crazy, busy buyers. After I wrote it, people came up to me and said, oh my God, Jill, this is like really working. And I'm getting through, and people are talking to me, and it's like I'm having conversations. And then they looked at me, and they said, but you know, Jill, I am crazy busy, too. What do you have for me? And I looked at them, and I said, I really suck at time management. I have nothing for you. Nothing. And I really mean it. I am really lousy at time management. But I thought, for a long time, I thought that was the problem, that it was a time management issue. But then the more and more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was, it was not a time management issue. It was an issue that goes far beyond time management. It was an issue of just way too much to do. Way too much to do and way too much to learn. Seriously, way too much to learn because the world is constantly shifting. How many of you are doing the same job you did two years ago? Any of you? Some of you? How many of you have got a new project that you don't understand and it's kind of a little bit different from what you've done before? 
some of you. See, this is what I mean. And the information is just coming at us, and it's coming at us, and it's coming at us, and we have to learn as fast as we can. But our human brains are not trained to learn this fast. They have not been developed over the time in order to do this. So what we have are all these people. <gasps> what happened? I did it. All right, now, now you want to know why I can't do the drones, because I can't push the right buttons. Right. Right, so we are living in a state of perpetual overwhelm. This is really what people are in the sales field are worried, are worried about right now. How do I continue to learn all this stuff about my customers, about my market, about my products and services? At the same time, I have to deliver the results. And that's the hard part, because salespeople are, you know, are, are they're focused on outcomes, and yet they are challenged with learning. Now, a lot of people say to me, Jill, you want us to spend more time learning. I have so much to do that I can't stop and learn. I've just got that much that has to get done. So how am I supposed to fit this learning thing into my already overflowing schedule? And I just want to address that right up front because honest to God, this learning thing, if you take a look at your schedule and what most people are doing, they're not doing things as effectively as they can. And there's a ton of waste in the sales process with people contacting a wide variety of customers, saying the wrong things, getting no responses, proposals going un you know, unanswered, meetings that don't lead to anything. So it, there's like, the waste is in the sales process. And my whole perspective is that we need to stop this craziness where we're running forward, huh? Stop the madness, right. Because it's crazy and we need to say what works, what is really working today and we need to use our brains in order to do this. And a lot of companies aren't stopping there, they're just saying rush, 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 more, 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 make more calls, call more people, more proposals, more, 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 more is not the answer. In my perspective, this is what we really need to do in order to speed up our sales. We need to slow down. And that is so antithetical to what most sales organizations are based on. But yet I think it is the predominant thing that we actually need to focus on more than anything, get people to slow down, to use their brains, to figure out what is it that's going to make the biggest difference, to take the right actions, to think about things in a way that will truly lead to the outcomes that they're trying to do. Now I want to share with you a little bit about my background before I came here. My, prior to um, doing a lot of speaking and, and writing on sales, I actually worked in... I had my own company, but I worked as a product launch specialist. And so I worked in the gap between marketing and sales. And during the course of the year, I would work with 8 to 10, sometimes up to 12 different clients in totally different market segments. And I had to learn as much as I humanly could, as much as was possible in the shortest amount of time. And when they'd come out with this new product, and I usually only had three months to get ready to help them. I'd work with them to learn all this and I had to A, create a strong value proposition that their customers would resonate with, create playbooks for their salespeople that would fully outline, here's what you start with, here's what you do next, here's what to expect, here's the key players, here's, their buyer, here's the buyer's journey, the whole works, and then they'd come out with this launch thing where they'd invite all their salespeople in and they'd tell everybody about here's this new whatever it is, product or service that we're doing and then it was my job to get on the stage and to talk, okay, and my thing is, okay, now that you've learned what it is that you're selling, you got to forget all that and focus on what makes successful selling. So this is the graphic, I just want to show you this graphic. This is the graphic, it is the only content I had for 15 years as a consultant. And I would go in and I would talk to marketing departments and I, I would say, here's what I typically see. You're over there, you're getting your stuff ready, all set to launch into the sales force. You throw it over the wall to your salespeople and what happens? You expect them to run out and go get them. And that's what you tell them, go get them. You can sell this thing, just go get them. Well, here's what happens three months later. What happens three months later? Sales are not materializing the way people thought. Marketing is looking at sales and they're saying, 
the sales is looking at marketing and saying the product is bad. And what else is sales saying, saying to marketing? Sales is saying to marketing, you're not doing the job. We need more brochures. We need more collateral. We need more marketing. We need more presence out there. And marketing is saying to sales, or sales is saying to marketing now, that's what, oh, now I'm confused. Marketing is saying to sales, you guys just don't know how to sell value, right? You, you don't know how to sell value. But you know what? That's because they never connected the dots on what salespeople needed in order to be successful. So this is the world that I lived in for 15 years as a consultant. And what really has shaped what I really you know, want to talk about today. How can you get salespeople to rapidly learn this stuff? And part of it is a function of choosing what to learn. Because salespeople can't learn everything all at once. They can only learn a portion of it. And my experience in working with companies is that they want to dump things in their salespeople's head. They think that their heads are like empty buckets and you just keep pouring more stuff in their head. And the more you pour in, it's going to stick, right? But the more you pour in, it's like a leaky bucket. Our head is like a leaky bucket and it just kind of comes and oozes right out. And the less that, is, that, that sticks. And so the question then becomes, what do salespeople really need to know in order to be effective? Because they don't need to know everything. They don't need to know everything. And so I actually spent a lot of time, you know, like I said, I had to do these 8, 10, 12 times a year. And I had to spend a lot of time sorting things out and saying what is important here and what isn't. So here's what I want to talk about a couple of things. Okay, now I, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So here's some of the things that I discovered, you know, in terms of working with salespeople. Um, first of all, the crucial thing is what is essential. And nobody is really sitting down and saying what is essential. You're hiring new people. You're all bringing new people on board. Do you, have you asked what's essential for your salespeople? What is essential? Like, you have onboarding processes, and some of them involve, you know, just going through the HR crap that you have to bring them up to speed with and telling them about your product. But the truth of the matter is, what really, really, truly is essential? What don't they have to learn? I mean, this is, like, so important that you, I can't stress it. Less is more. Less is more when you're trying to onboard people. Less is more when you're launching new products. Less is more when you're going after a new market segment. So what's essential? You have to start sorting that out. And then after asking what's essential, what you need to say, in what sequence now do people need to learn this? Because some things are based on other things. And this is the hardest thing for sales organizations to do in marketing organizations because they want to dump. We got to tell them everything. Everybody says, we got to tell them everything. They need to know this. No, they don't. There are things that they don't need to know now, and I don't think we understand that. And we really make some serious mistakes. So over the course of the years, if you take a look at what really does work, and here's what I found was the most crucial thing of all, buyer insights. And it is the most overlooked thing I see in onboarding new salespeople in launching new products and going after new market segments, the failure to get deep information on the buyer is more, it's, it's, it's like criminal. That's all I can say. It's like criminal. Because your salespeople, without this information, they have no foundation for anything else. And so you can tell them about the product, and you can tell them about the value proposition, and you can tell them about you know, what you say and what you do. And without this knowledge of what's really, really, truly going on, because the status quo is the most important competitor. And again, I see a lot of companies saying, here's our competitors. We need to teach them about our competitors. No, you don't need to teach all that much about your competitors going out of the gate. The only competitor at the beginning is the status quo. And that is what we're all fighting. And how many people actually stop and say, oh, God, that's what we really need to focus on. We really need to teach our people about what they're going to encounter when they pick up the phone, even if, like, Salesforce here, what is their competitor? In many cases, it's spreadsheets, right? In many cases, it's spreadsheets. Maybe not in their big accounts, but certainly there's a lot of people out there still using spreadsheets. But do the people who are selling to the SMBs really understand spreadsheets and how people are doing it? Probably not in most cases. It amazes me how the depth of knowledge of a customer is so incredibly weak, and yet it is the foundation of everything that needs to be done. And then the other thing 
two that I want to say, again, when you look at the human side of this, is we really have to help people connect the dots. And so what I'm saying here relates to connecting the dots about what we learn with our customers to the value it brings. And we can't assume that people's heads are going to make this leap. Like I said, I've worked with companies as they're launching these new products, going after new market segments, and they say, oh my God, oh my God, when people see this new product, they are just going to drool. They're going to be so excited about how fast it is or what it does. But the truth of the matter is they don't drool. They don't drool. They look at it and they go, how, how much does it cost? Can it do this? And they usually are trying to rule it out. So the honest thing is we have to connect the dots for our salespeople, and they really have to know what it is that truly does matter here. So this is another strategy that I think is absolutely crucial today. Now, again, because I've worked with salespeople a lot, I know that, that retention is not great when you're going after new things, and so it's crucial to develop sales tools. Um, in the 1980s, I was developing the playbooks for my customers. Playbooks are essential. Without playbooks, you don't have a, a basis for starting. But I would also say there are things that are as simple as checklists that you can have that are just really easy tools for people when they're first starting to learn something. And again, sales acceleration, we got to look about how we can get people off the, off the mark fast. And it's, and it's really got to be something that's easy for them. Now, on my website, I, and I have like, I have a, a email evaluator tool. I have a voicemail evaluator evaluator tool. These are just little things that you can go and download for free that help people accelerate their learning. This is something that you should be doing in your own company, taking tools. Here's why too. You need to do the tools so they don't have to remember everything because the more they have to remember, the less they remember. So you want to offload things from their brain because you want to free up their brain to do the other things. Research into neuroscience, which is I'm spending a lot of time studying neuroscience right now, is just showing that the human, the human condition, I mean, we cannot handle multiple tasks, multiple cognitive tasks at one time. There was some research recently that showed that somebody who was trying to manage two cognitive tasks at, concurrently, they went from the intelligence of a Harvard MBA down to that of an eight-year-old by trying to manage two cognitive tasks concurrently. There's also research that shows, if you take a look at frequent texting or emailing and jumping back and forth between work. Now, this is a common condition that salespeople face. I'm jumping back and forth, jumping back and forth. Research is showing, just on this simple area, that people who jump back and forth, women who do it, again, this is texting and email, their IQ drops five points. Now, so women are getting stupider, but men are getting even more stupider. <laughs> huh? You start out stupider and you decline faster with multiple, <laughs> with interruptions, because honestly, what it does show is that men lose 15 IQ points by jumping back and forth from one task to another. The email, to thinking. Now this is horrible because if you're, if you're structuring your salespeople's time so that they're jumping tasks, they're retaining less, it's taking longer for them to remember, it, you're slowing the uptake of their information and again, if you don't structure their time so it's chunked, we're going to only focus on this right now, you can extend their learning time by 40 to 60%. You don't have that amount of time. And so the human side of sales, sales acceleration shows that your brain has to be considered because we're human and we can't do, we can't go back and forth. It just slows down our entire processing power. This is the human side. This is what neuroscience is showing. So anything you can do to offload information off a person's brain is really a smart thing to do. And the final slide that I just want to say is that I think it's crucial for every organization to create an agile sales culture. And to me, agility is the most important thing we need right now. And an agile sales culture is one in which people are constantly learning. It's like they're not afraid of failing. Failing should be a common topic of conversation. Oh, you failed. Well, what did you learn? And, it, and it's more than just that. It's taking a look at how can we always be experimenting. To me, sales is a continuum where you start over here, where you're not effective, and you go all the way over here to the most effective thing. When we're bringing new people on board, they're not very good. 
and we need to move them here. But a lot of people stop once somebody has been around for a while. Instead of that, you need to constantly be forming teams to focus on how can we experiment and try different things to see what works better. How can we all as a group take our, our level up to a new level, a level that we don't even know about today, and a level that might respond to the changing market dynamics that we're, that we're facing. So this, to me, is what an agile sales culture is about. This is, to me, what we really need to think about. It's the human side of sales acceleration. To me, technology, I love technology, but it's a tool. It's a tool. And we have to work with the, the human condition and how our brain processes things and make sure that people can leverage the technology to the best possible thing. I am not good at technology, okay? So I'm being honest here. However, I just came back from the LinkedIn conference and I found out that I joined LinkedIn in 2003 and I am member number 66,000 32 out of 300 members. I took a look at LinkedIn and I said, this is technology that can help salespeople if they can figure it out. The clients I work with today have barely touched it yet. And again, because they haven't learned how to embrace something like this and figure out how it works in their thing. LinkedIn is like a no-brainer to those of us who understand it. But to those people who don't, it's, it's something that they have no clue what it can do for their organization. And it's the same with any kind of technology. We have to help people understand the value that it'll bring to them. And we have to give it to them in bite-sized chunks so they can learn what they need to learn to get started and then get better, better, and better, one part at a time. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover in the presentation part. And I know Ken has some questions he wants to ask me, and so I will turn it over to him to ask me an intelligent question or two. An intelligent question, Ken. So we're going to kind of limit this, you know. Okay. Give me a minute. Okay, intelligent. No. I'm going to ask a purely emotional question for a minute, and then we'll go to intelligent. Is that okay? We're asking every single thought leader who's joined us today why they love Salesforce.com. Is that okay? You can ask me that, and I can answer I don't love Salesforce.com. Okay, there you go. I don't. Um, I think it's a good technology, but do I love it? No, to me it's a technology. Tell me more. <laughs> it's only about the difference it can make for people. And if it's used well, it has value. If it's not, I mean, it's, to me, like I said, technology is a tool. It's not something I love. Fair enough. Huh? Second question. In the world of sales, what do you love? I love leading edge stuff that nobody else is working on. I mean, I know that sounds strange to say. But to me, nobody's talking about this learning agility and how crucial it is to sales organizations. And, and I look at salespeople. I look at sales teams and I see I see total struggle in terms of dealing with all this information. It's just overwhelming to people and I'm and I mean for two, three years I've been working on ideas and how to bring out this information to sales organization because nobody's talking about it. So that's what I love is sales challenges that aren't addressed yet. That's great. That's great. Now I'm gonna ask you something um, I, I mentioned when I introduced Jill that she has the number one following of, of any thought leader we've worked with. She, twice in a row, uh, we invite all of our thought leaders to collaborate together on our events. We had 15,700 the first virtual summit, 22,000 people the second, and consistently she was first in getting people to join and follow her in her presentation. Could you give us a couple of tips of things, how you would credit that to happen? How, how is it people follow you so well to the events that you speak at? That's a, that's a hard question. That's not, uh, I think it, I do have a loyal following. I mean, I've got a large database of 130,000 people that read my newsletter and read my blog every week. And I have a lot of really good content on my site that people have downloaded and read. So I have a ton of stuff that way. But I think mostly it's because of my attitude and the way I talk. Like, I'm not fancy dancy. And I'm pretty down to earth. And I talk like. Like, this is what you guys need to know, and it's pretty plain spoken. I mean, I just, I am kind of get to the point a lot, and, and a little bit in your face. But I do it, but I'm from Minnesota, and in Minnesota, we're nice when we hit people. You know, we smile, and we say, that's really stupid. 
And then he goes, oh, thank you for saying that to me. And people like it when I tell them they're stupid or it doesn't work anymore. But it's really because I'm being nice and I'm really doing it with positive intent. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you. Any questions from the audience today? So that's our quote for the day. It's okay to say to someone you're stupid if you mean well. Write that one down, would you? I love that. But I do it with a, I do it with a smile on my face. I mean, that's really important, you know. It is important. And they say, thank you. Honest, it's, it's amazing how many people thank me, thank, them for call, thank me for calling them stupid or saying, you're not going to do that, are you? And they go, why? I said, well, don't you want it to work? And they go, well, yeah, why? Well, <laughs> You know, and so I'm really nice to them, and I share with them ideas that work. That's true. You know, and I'm always brainstorming ideas, and, and honestly, my total intent is to raise the level of, of professionalism in sales and to help people be more successful. Yes. We can all see that, Jill, and thank you so much. Intent is everything. Uh, what we've seen as we've offered this content to people who join us is we're not here to sell. We're here to educate and grow and build the industry, and the inside sales and the sales industry is what... Uh, puts gas in the, in the engine for all of us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Any other questions for Jill while we've, we've got her here? All right, let's give her another big hand if we could.